Thank Good you, morning, Kate. everyone. I'm Vallabhi, the convener for this workshop on behalf of the collective Curating for Culture. Before we get started, may I please request you all to ensure that your devices are on mute, your WhatsApp tab on the browser is closed, and any electronic devices around you are on silent or no sound mode. These sessions are being recorded and screenshots will be taken for documentation and dissemination purposes. Hope we have your consent for the same. If it is convenient for you, we request that the participants may keep their videos on during the session for making it interactive. Also, to avoid any disturbance during the talk on Google Meet, I'll be sharing a Google Doc link where you can put in your thoughts and questions. I would now request Ishita to tell us about today's plan and speaker Sneha Raghavan. Thanks, Vallabhi. Um, uh, we, I mean, I don't have much to say about the plans. Sneha has been quite thorough with sending us uh, a very detailed workshop plan. Uh, to begin with, Sneha uh, is a senior researcher and project head at uh, Asia Art Archive in India, which is based out of New Delhi. Uh, together with her colleagues, she works on projects that range from digitizing artist archives and creating online bibliographies to editing publications and organizing workshops and seminars on art history in the region. Um, apart from this formal uh, in, uh, introduction, I must accept that Asia Art Archive uh, has been a go-to place for uh, a young archivist like myself as well. And every other um, project I take up, every other dialogue I get into, I make sure that that reference comes up. Uh, it's because uh, when we were setting up SEPT archives, it was around the same time Asia Art Archive came to India. So it was interesting to see, you know, the whole archiving culture growing in different ways. Uh, and then, of course, referring to each other's material. So I've always been excited about getting somebody from Asia Art Archive to tell us what's happening there. Uh, thank you, Sin Sneha, for accepting our invitation. Um, and very specifically for this program where we are in this stage is to move each project into information management stage. Uh, whether in the form of cataloging, classification, coding. So these different aspects or different technical terms of the larger subject of information management is what we'll address today. And Sneha has an excellent plan in place. So over to you, Sneha. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ishita, for the uh, invitation. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be a part of uh, this program. Um, and I think uh, just having gone through uh, some of the briefs about each of the participants, uh, you know, projects, I think it's a, it's a real testament to how much um, all of us in our individual institutional capacities are invested in sort of building archives and particularly personal archives. Um, you know, uh, but I think uh, the investment in personal archives um, is specific to certain geographies as well, um, where there is, in a sense, um, a, a dearth of institutional sort of support and institutional archives that that also pushes one to into sort of the direction of um, exploring the possibilities of the personal. Um, so I just wanted to sort of also share a little bit um, about my own entry into sort of this, this domain of archives. It, it doesn't come from sort of uh, having studied archival or library sciences or anything. It comes actually more from, you know, having studied art history and from, you know, having done research. So I'm no more a technical sort of person than any of you here. So that's that's something I want to put right out there. Um, and, and I feel like it's important that, you know, each of us um, sort of tries to mark out where we enter, um, you know, so, uh, you know, from what locations we enter um, when we are looking at, you know, sort of the, the personal archives that we are engaging with, because I think it, it shapes very much how we work with the archives. It shapes very much how we think about the function of archives um, and what we do with them, you know, also sort of imaginatively and creatively, not just to think about the archives in sort of um, as necessarily very serious sort of uh, 
institutional sort of apparatuses, but also sort of um, things that one can play around with as well at the same time, um, that it is a creative pursuit as well. Um, so for me, um, you know, organizing and, and annotating sort of, uh, you know, the personal archive is, is as much, if not more, a conceptual question as well than, than merely a technical one. So even though information management, which is what the workshop today is going to be about, is technical, and, and definitely there are parts of it that are, um, um, you know, I think it's important that we think of these only as protocols, as guiding principles for us. Um, what interests me more, I think, about information management and what I plan to share with all of you today are more sort of the conceptual frameworks for thinking about information in the context of archives. Um, so if you don't mind, I, I'm going to start um, sharing my screen right now. Great. Um, so I think as um, Ishita said, um, and as I think uh, Vallabhi uh, said, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to just keep taking note of them. I think there's a Google Doc that's being shared. Uh, but also there are sort of, I mean, the plan for today is after my sort of one hour presentation, uh, we will move into, uh, uh, you know, I think participants have been distributed uh, into uh, breakout rooms where you can sort of discuss um, your thoughts regarding the presentation as well, as well as questions, um, etc. So, you know, so please just feel free to, you know, keep putting those down. Um, and, and we'll have an hour long discussion to follow afterwards. Um, so before we step into sort of the domain of what it means to sort of manage the information around one's personal archive, um, I think it is still useful to keep reminding ourselves of, um, you know, what we mean when we're talking about archives. It's, it's always good to have conceptual clarity on, on this. I presume that this has been covered and, and covered quite a bit in the uh, in the workshop already. Um, but I think it's it's always useful to just keep reminding ourselves. And, and so I'm just going to do a quick recap. Um, and, and to start by thinking about what is an archive and, and how it collects. Um, a simple way of doing this, obviously, is to ask, um, what is the difference between an archive, a museum, and a library? All three are collecting institutions, right? Um, but what is the difference? Um, very fundamentally, in terms of what they collect, right? Um, now, typically, I would do this in a Q&A sort of format, but I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to sort of proceed and, and sort of uh, 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 say, you know, sort of say things. I, I hope that's that's OK. Um, uh, so a, a library typically is is a place that that carries, um, you know, published media, whether we're talking about books, magazines, videotapes, you know, audio books, et cetera, et cetera. But these published media are what we typically understand as secondary documents. Right. Um, and these are made available through either, you know, uh, borrowing, referencing, et cetera, for individual sort of study consumption, et cetera. A museum, on the other hand, what it collects are unique objects, right? And, and these are for the purposes of preservation, for the purposes of exhibition, and, and therefore uh, viewing, um, right? But, but what it collects are objects. While the library collects secondary documents, what the museum collects are objects, right? Um, now, the archive, on the other hand, collects what we, I'm, I'm sure all of you have been sort of engaging with, um, in, through your projects, are primary documents. Right? So these include everything from letters to notes to manuscripts, blueprints, drawings, um, ephemera, photographs, et cetera, et cetera. And these are sort of amassed for purposes of research and study. Right. Um, I like to sort of use this work called um, One and Three Chairs um, by the artist, uh, uh, by the conceptual artist Joseph Kosuth, uh, who made this work in 1965, to explain, in a sense, uh, the difference between sort of how these three uh, institutions collect the work, of course, is, is very different. Um, it sort of questions, I mean, so what you see is, is basically a chair, you see a photograph of the chair, and you have the dictionary definition of the, of the word uh, chair, right? And perhaps all three are chairs, or perhaps all three are codes for the chair. Um, but fundamentally, the question is that, you know, how is any of this or how is all of this an, an artwork, right? And, and so this was, you know, sort of one of the most sort of pathbreaking works in, um, um, in the domain of conceptual art. Uh, but for us, I think this work is, you know, and, and it, it sort of prods one to ask what is art, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, um, but I think we will sort of repurpose this work to arrive at an understanding of the differences between a library, an archive, and a museum. So the chair itself 
as an object, as a unique object, is something that fits better in the context of a museum. Um, the photograph as a document of the chair is something that fits into an archive. And let us say um, a, a book or, or a published sort of text about the chair is something that goes into the library. These are sort of simple sort of ways of understanding the differences between the three sort of modes of, of collecting. Right. Today, of course, all of these, you know, these three, the archive, the museum and the library um, have in a sense, you know, that the divisions between them have begun to be blurred. And, and you, you see that, you know, they're beginning to sort of um, um, lose uh, some sense of specificity ah. and then they're beginning to bleed into all aspects of our life. So we have a situation where everyone, it seems, has an archive. Everything can be archived. Etc. Right, but also thinking about how some items within these institutions are positioned in multiple institutions. Take, for example, photographs. Photographs, if they are positioned as objects, can be placed within a museum. But photographs uh, considered as documents will will fall within an archive. Similarly, if you take the map as an object, it it you know is is then an object for a museum. But the map as a document. Is, is a, or a record is something that, that is positioned within the archive. Um, if you take something like a rare catalog or something like that, as a publication, it's something that fits within the library, but seen as a record or as a document, it's something that fits within the archive, right? So fluidity, I think, is, is, is very good. And I think it's being put to very creative sort of um, reimaginations today. Um, and yet, as, as people involved in, in building archives um, and, and in sort of um, invested in thinking about the organization and the management of archives, it is useful to have some basic parameters for what constitutes um, an archive, right? Um, all right. Now, apart from what an archive collects, um, the archive itself as an apparatus, as a system, is composed of three elements, right? Um, the first is accumulation that it, it brings together a collection of, of records, a collection of, of documents, right? So it isn't that this collection exists per se, but that it is an active sort of uh, process of bringing something together, of forming a collection, right? But forming the collection is, as you know, just, just the first step. The second is, of course, of preservation. So the collection that has been brought together has to be preserved. If in physical form, we take care to preserve these documents, ensure that, you know, that they are kept um, um, carefully to ensure that they do not undergo any further deterioration, et cetera, et cetera. And digitization is another form of, of preservation, right? Um, we, we digitize documents so that in a sense, at least at, at, one, at least in, in the digital sort of, uh, with digital technology, it's preserved, it's frozen. Um, the physical object itself may continue to, you know, sort of um, weather, but the, but the digital object, um, at least um, we, we imagine, will, will, will stay um, preserved. Um, and, and the third sort of um, um, element um, that, that is sort of crucial to thinking about the archive is actually that of retrieval. Um, by, by retrieval, we mean that an archive, when we're thinking about sort of building and constructing personal archives or any archive for that matter, it isn't merely sort of the, the making of the collection and the preserving of the collection that is, you know, those are not the only important parts. In fact, what makes an archive an archive is really how we provide protocols of access, how we sort of come up with classification systems, what are sort of the annotations um, that, you know, um, that we sort of overlay onto our records. Etc. Right, um, and it is really with this third aspect of retrieval of, of um, that that we are concerned here today um, in this workshop on on information um, management. Right, um, so I guess what you know I'm trying to say is that uh, a mere sort of collection does not make an archive. Right, so for example, um, you know I have a digital sort of folder on my on my computer which has let's say a list of books. Um, you know, um, on my D drive or my E drive, that in and, in and of itself is not an archive, right? A collection that is preserved, a collection that is imbued with a system and a protocol for access and retrieval is what, <clears throat> sorry, is what turns something from a collection into an archive. Now, in the institutional sort of sense of the term, archives have always been um, sites of power. 
right of legitimating historical events and and histories as such so um what is not in the archive has often been understood as you know something that has not happened in history right so here we have um the philosopher michel foucault who says the archive is the first law of what can be said the system that governs the appearance of statements as unique events right so in this sort of understanding the archive is no longer a collection of documents um you know that which are to be interpreted but it actually becomes a system right a system with its own sort of discursive history um and and in that sense it is that which provides it is the put it is the placing of documents within an archive that that allows these documents to become statements to become documents of history to become documents of events right um so in that sense the archive as an institution the archive as an apparatus is is extremely sort of um um it is uh, imbued in in that sense with with power right it is not a neutral sort of body at all um however um what does an archive look like how do we sort of encounter an archive right um so i mean this is um you know a work by um, that that i like to sort of um, uh, refer to a lot it's it's a work by the artist uh, photographer dayanita singh and and the work is 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 part of a, a series called um, file room um, where it is it is basically sort of uh, a tribute to um, paper right and in today's age of you know digitization and and sort of you know um, the digitization everything is being digitized around us right you have you know information knowledge all of these things are being sort of digitized um and and therefore in in sort of these times of of uh, rapid and and sort of uh, mass scale of digitization um the the series um, that that came out in 2011 is basically a tribute to um sort of uh, the role of paper it is a it is a it is sort of an exploration of sort of bureaucracy it is an exploration of what the archive looks like behind the scenes um you know seemingly chaotic but but you know the, it's the archivist who actually knows how to navigate this this labyrinth right um and there is in a sense um you know the romance of the archive here right as this glorious space you know um, made up of paper and of dust um you know containing sort of fragile precious things etc and and these are things that are made all the more so relevant you know paradoxically in a time when everything is being digitized right um but a point i'd like to make keeping this work in mind is really that this is not the way that we typically encounter an archive right we never sort of uh encounter an archive in its entirety we never gain access to the archive itself quite the same way that we are able to browse a library or or walk through um, a museum right we never you know sort of encounter the archive in its en entirety we always en you know encounter the archive through the infrastructure um um of the catalog right this is another sort of artwork and i'm sorry for bringing so many images but this is just a few of the artworks um and and i can't help it it's sort of uh, the the field that i i i work in so the the references that i i sort of draw on are also artistic sort of references um and and this is you know um the what what you're seeing here is is basically the catalog um the card catalog um and and this is a work by uh, the sri lankan artist um, the shanathanan titled cabinet of resistance um this work itself just to tell you very briefly is is situated in the context of um the immense sort of scale of uh, displacement and destruction that um, sri lanka sort of experienced and went through in 30 years of civil war um leading to severe sort of gap in histories um you know as well and and including of course one among which most infamously was the burning of the jaffna library um and um, the artist shanathan and his his you know sort of this this project sort of aims to sort of address <clears throat> these um displacements through sort of taking on this this sort of archival sort of form um that documents personal histories of individuals um you know from from cutting across various fields uh, but using sort of stories narratives drawings photographs etc particularly of people who survived the war right and and so these through these sort of narratives etc you know it it provides a glimpse into sort of the lives of people um you know who were who were especially sort of displaced etc etc but what we can see what it what it does is it really sort of produces a nice collage of 
you know, of memory, of oral history, of text, of image, etc., culminating sort of in the form of a library sort of index card box that that you can see here, um, and and very creatively sort of playing with the idea of archive, memory, uh, and even index, right? Um, but back to sort of the, the the point that I was making is that how we typically encounter the archive is through the catalog. And therefore, I mean, and this is precisely why how we produce the catalog, how we manage the information of the archive is, is of crucial importance and, and something that we're going to um, uh, focus on um, here today. Um, now, just to sort of um, at a very sort of preliminary level, um, just to share, uh, when we say when we talk about classification, we are we are referring to a broader sort of practice, a system of ordering, organizing, dividing knowledges, right? I mean, so that's classification at its most basic sort of uh, um, uh, definition. Um, what is cataloging? Cataloging is basically a process of creating information about records or creating metadata, right? Um, so. Um, you know, so for instance, this looks like um, a sort of a library um, catalog, right? Um, you know, if this was sort of the analog or the non-digital sort of form of the library card catalog, this would be sort of a more uh, digital sort of version of a, of a library card catalog, right? And and what you see here as, as sort of, um, yeah, and, and what this catalog contains is basically uh, what we call metadata. Metadata is basically you know, um, data about data, right? Um, so, mm, you know, I mean, so it's a metadata is basically data that provides information about other data. So um, this is basically all of the information about a book, for example, right? What, what you're seeing here. So a library catalog, like the image that you're seeing on the screen, um, typically gives you sort of, you know, um details such as you know the basic details such as the author the year of the publication the title of the publication uh how many sort of images it has what are copyright details place of publication what type of media it is etc cetera, etc cetera. so things that are sort of very much off the book itself and then you have a set of sort of you know let's say annotations over and above this which include details like you know for instance what are the various um subjects that that it falls within Right. Um, and so all of these things are things that will help people sort of um, find the, 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 the relevant books. Right. Um, earlier, of course, one used card catalogs, which were either arranged sort of either alphabetically or, um, you know, subject wise, one would one would see card catalogs, you know, most libraries um, and, and, you know, would typically have, you know, the, the same set of um, you know, information about the books, but arranged in two different catalogs. Um, one which would, you know, follow either a, uh, one which would follow an alphabetical sort of system and one which would follow a, a discipline or a subject wise um, sort of system, right? Uh, but with the digital, what you have is is basically sort of a, a, a merging of, of all of those things. And, and with sort of uh, the digital database, you're able to sort of search and filter across but using just one single sort of database, right? Um, now, over time, of course, there have come to be, you know, a lot of accepted sort of conventions about ordering knowledges, et cetera, about how things should be grouped, um, you know, et cetera. And, and, um, and we have come to take these, you know, these systems of ordering, these systems of classification, you know, which were created, we must remember, at a very specific time, in a very specific context, for a specific purpose, we have come to take very often these classification systems as truths. We often don't question them. We often don't wonder if there can be other ways of ordering knowledges, right? Um, and which is why I thought to share this piece. I hope some of you read at least this paragraph, if not the rest of the um, rest of the chapter, um, which is basically sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, which is basically the introduction or the preface to um, Foucault's book called The Order of Things, where he says that, you know, one of the things, I mean, one of the sort of, um, um, you know, sort of the most amazing sort of uh, ways of classifying something um, is, is what he found in Borges's um, a book where there's a passage that quotes a certain Chinese encyclopedia where animals are divided into 
sort of and and the categories of you know animals that belong to the emperor animals that are embalmed animals that are tame animals that are suckling pigs you know and and so on and so forth right and 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 so this sort of the wonderment of this taxonomy right i mean this is something which sort of makes evident sort of the limitations of our own sort of in a sense um the the uh, our own sort of knowledge systems perhaps right while most people would regard this 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 classification system um of animals to be you know sort of ludicrous in a sense um you know, foucault sort of views this as an opportunity to sort of recognize the limitations of our own sort of classic classificatory systems right um and and you know it it shows in a sense that there is a certain sort of rigidity to the way in which we are thinking about classificatory systems which prevents us from thinking about alternative modes of classification right we always already sort of assume that when we have to prepare a catalog that it must contain so and so and so details not anything else right um another thing that i thought this this sort of um uh quotation citation sort of brings to the fore is that most people sort of presume that you know whatever classification schemes um they present whether it's you know for their archives for their libraries whatever it is that those classification schemes represent an objective reality right um this is the truth right that that there can be no other way of doing it um and and so this sort of in a sense is also a call for us to think about um you know imaginative sort of ways of of perhaps thinking about um classifying of of categorizing of of perhaps inventorying you know the materials within our archives right um and and what we might want to remember is that classification schemes and systems like these are fundamentally sort of cultural codes of interpretation they are acts of interpretation right and and in that sense they are sort of discursive formations they are not truths that exist over there these are things that have come through sort of practices um and and you know um and so on right so this sort of is a, a, a in a sense an imaginative and a creative call to cataloging perhaps and even though it is something that institutional archives perhaps um are are not sort of uh, would not um so quickly take to these these um, uh, these sort of calls um the one sort of area where um people have sort of in a sense creatively pushed the limits of uh, classificatory systems is an artistic and creative sort of practice right um so for example you have uh you know uh, the atlas group archive which is um you know which is an amazing sort of archive um from beirut uh but um um and is in fact sort of uh, you know it's got all manner of material etc cetera, etc cetera, and is in fact actually uh, uh, an entirely sort of fictional um um archive uh, or for that matter you have um you know um this amazing sort of archive which i'm sure you know some of you uh, invested in in video in in you know sort of in cinema etc would know which is the padma um archive pad.ma um which is the archive of footages um and and if you look at sort of um, uh the if you look at sort of how they have you know sort of keyworded or tagged or whatever their their um uh the content you can see that it isn't merely just by title source project topic director etc cetera, etc cetera, but actually moves into things like you know aspect ratio uh hue the saturation lightness the number of cuts the number of words words per minute etc etc as ways of sort of um searching of annotating of cataloging the the archive right um and this is you know this this leads me this this particularly sort of leads me to um a point that i wanted to make about um uh you know the digital and what sort of a uh, changes it has it has really brought about um in sort of thinking about how to organize um one's archive um and and one thing of course about the digital is that there is a great deal of in a sense um uh, auto archiving that is happening right like if we wanted if we were to think about you know what would be in a sense the sites of our own personal archives right um you know uh, people would have to go digging into let's say our our social media pages they would have to go digging into let's say our emails but these are all sites which are auto archiving right we don't need to do the work in a sense of really um collecting of course one would eventually but these are also sites where in a sense everything that that every action um every gesture that that one one does on these platforms is already in a sense archived 
right? It's 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 already sort of stored, right? Um, the other sort of change that that the digital sort of um, Oh, just to also quickly share um, that um, that the group have actually, I mean, at Padma, they, they also put forward this amazing sort of 10 theses on the archive. So if, if and, and this is this is just the 10 points, but there's an elaboration of these points um, below. So if you're interested, do go and, and look for this if, if you are interested in sort of um, um, a manifesto for thinking about archives, as it were. Um, but Another thing that the digital sort of enables is sort of thinking of um, um, thinking about sort of annotations, thinking about sort of the you know the uh, thinking about metadata um, in with the form along with the form of the database, right? Um, now, just to give you a, a, a quick example, so the the scholar Lev Malinovich, what he does is he makes this difference between um, how sort of a narrative you know, uh, I mean, how a database and narrative, how both of these sort of tell very different, um, provide sort of very different sort of stories in a sense. Um, and, and to sort of illustrate this, I'd like to take the example of um, a book which is called the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema. Now, in a typical book, for instance, right, um, you know, if you were to sort of put together an encyclopedia of Indian cinema, what would you do? You would either go about things alphabetically, as you can see in the list over here, um, or you would perhaps go about chronologically, etc. Right. So, in, you know, and this is what is called a narrative form. After A, you have B, after B, you have C, you know, and so on and so forth. Or after 1910, you have 1911 and so on and so forth in a chronological sort of in a linear fashion. And this is what he calls a narrative form as opposed to the horizontality of a database. A database basically has multiple entry points, right? And this is basically using sort of the um, the similar, I mean, using actually the same platform as um, the Padma website. You have this, the contents of the Encyclopedia of Indian Cinema, the same contents of it transformed here in the form of a digital database, right? So it's literally all of this. Um, that that you can now see in in this form, right? And and what you can see very clearly at at you know um, right at the outset is that you have multiple simultaneous sort of entry points, and this in a sense is understood as the possibility of the database as opposed to the narrative, which has a limitation in terms of what stories it is able to tell you, right? Um, okay, so. With this background, I think what I'd like to do is maybe um, shift sort of gears a little bit and um, come down to um, sort of thinking about personal archives uh, and so on. So this is um, a, a favorite picture of mine. It's actually taken by my colleagues in, in Hong Kong um, um, who several years back visited the studio of an artist called Habik Chun. Um, and, and this was Habik Chun's studio, right? Um, Personal archives very often um, from the outside or at the outset look like they have absolutely no system of organization, right? They look like they're this terrifying sort of mess. But what we have to be very aware of is that they all have their own systems, right? Just like how we order our things, everybody has their own sort of unique ways of, of organizing their materials. And in the lifetime of the individual, things would have been ordered according to how they wanted to retrieve it, right? So, you know, so with, with varying degrees of importance in terms of um, how often they would like to retrieve it, how safely they would like to keep it, um, those would all determine where spatially the, you know, the materials in the archive would be distributed, right? Um, and so the one thing that, that we sort of practice very much at the Asia Archive is also that there is no sort of single way of, of classifying. There is no single way of managing the information of an archive. Each archive is unique and therefore must be organized in, in unique ways. Um, uh, but there are, of course, some conventions um, that, that we can follow, right? How do we sort of um, make an archive go from this uh, to something like this? Right. And this is the work, of course, of, of institutional sort of archives, right, um, is to provide uh, a different sense of legibility, not to say that this is not legible. This is absolutely legible. It has its own schema, in a sense. And the archive, the institutional archive, in a sense, um, has its own another schema. Right. 
um and in order to do this in order to sort of manage this this information of your personal archive um it is useful to sort of um think of a couple of questions and a couple of prompts um the first being who is the imagined user of the archive um as much as we think that information management um may have nothing to do with um who is the imagined user of the archive um the imagined user of the archive is absolutely central to how we uh, catalog how we annotate um and uh, the information for our archive right um because it in a sense determines how deep one goes how far one goes what language one uses what fields one creates um etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's absolutely crucial to think about who is the the imagined um user of of the archive not only will it help you annotate it will also help you determine what to collect um you know as well because um if if in a sense you you anticipate a particular kind of user for your archive you will also collect material accordingly right um um it will it will i mean and and here in terms of in thinking about the imagined user of the archive you have to be quite prescient in the sense not just sort of the users that you know already but the work that one does with archives and the work that one does with personal archives is the work of thinking of the future right it's about anticipating who might be a potential sort of user of the archive and building it for that future right not for the present in that sense you're building it in the present um but uh, in a sense for the future right um the second sort of question is of course with regard to what is the story that you're trying to tell through this archive um you know and especially in the context of personal archives it it becomes crucial because um is it a life is it a is it a biography that you're trying to tell of a life in decades um is it about sort of the multiple sort of uh, facets of somebody's life what is it that takes precedence um and that will in a sense come to inform very much um how you sort of uh, 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 tell tell that um, tell that that story right the third thing is of course um, a very fundamental thing which is that all archives are constructed right they don't sort of simply exist um you know and and they are sort of about making a selection that selection making process can be can vary from person to person um in very layman terms we call this you know there's one mode which is called the vacuum cleaner approach um which is that you know you basically you know enter into somebody's sort of home or a studio or something like that you see whatever you see you sort of you know take all of it and and that basically is is how you construct the archive right um the other approach is a is a research approach where you enter somebody's archive with a set of questions in mind um you know with a with a framework in mind and then you make selections right of of what is what is important what is what is not important and i'll show you sort of examples of how how we have done that right um so all archives are sort of constructed all archives are about sort of making a selection and and one thing that i'd like to sort of mark over here very importantly especially for those of you who are working with relatively recent sort of practices is that archives are you know sort of temporal spatial entities they have to be separate from lived reality one one requires in a sense a distance a distance not just a spatial distance from the material but also a temporal distance um you know they they need to be relegated to the space of history um you can't sort of in a sense um i mean of course you can but it is generally ad advisable not to sort of um um uh, in a sense uh, uh, blur the boundaries between lived reality and the archive right um the archive sort of is 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 in a sense relegated to the to the space of history right so so ensure that um one puts a uh a, one puts a an end a, an end point to where the archive sort of concludes in a sense it's 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 crucial to to do so right um all right and and then of course that protocols of retrieval and access determine how we organize and and annotate 
um, archives if if it's a digital archive um, is it a digital archive but online or just a digital archive on a computer um, how do you plan to make this accessible um, are you going to make the entire archive itself accessible or are you planning to make only the catalog accessible um, you know how uh, I, I, so all of these things will determine how we organize and, and annotate our archives and the final point that i want to make is that it's crucial to try and make a balance between preserving the integrity of the archive and thinking of an end user what do i mean by this um let us say you're dealing with the personal archive of um, let's say a family member right um they may have sort of organized their materials in in their own way right depending on how they used it how they wanted to sort of keep it etc etc um as somebody who's coming in and building their personal archive um it's important for you to consider whether one to what extent sort of do you want to sort of maintain you know the their sort of systems of of classification right but what you have to keep in mind is who is who do you imagine is the end user of the archive right um and whether you know sort of maintaining the integrity of the archive is more important or is it thinking of the end user that is more important right so typically it involves a negotiation and a balance between the two right um and i'll i'll, I'll again illustrate all of these points through the case studies of of archives that i have um, worked with right um okay and and therefore in sort of you know the next 20 minutes or so what what i'm going to do is basically to show you sort of one um, a basic inventory i think these are things that you have already gone through um, but you know it's always useful just to recap some of these things what is sort of a basic inventory of of an archive um two is to think about collection levels hierarchies you know etc or what we at asia archive call the tree structure um and the third is to think about the metadata so the catalog the inventory um and so on right um okay um all right so now this is basically <sighs> something that we do as as a matter of practice right at the outset right so i think perhaps you, all of you are actually past this this stage right but let me just share with you sort of why this is useful um when we sort of visit somebody's personal archive right and and the work the field that i am in is where we visit personal archives of artists so very often it's you know their studios uh, and what they keep in their studios right um so what we typically do is when we sort of look around sort of the materials that they have and on this inventory we sort of start sorting the materials that they have we start putting them into various categories at this point they can be quite fluid right so this is 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 what we call the shoe box method of just sort of you know um, it's a it's a shoe box method as far as the physical archive is concerned where let's say you have a big pile of of different sort of things you put one sort of you know you 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 imagine that different boxes are kept for different types of material and you just keep sorting them into different things so that's the work that we do with with an in an, an, a basic sort of inventory like this we say okay what type of material is it um, approximately how many are there what what your frame are we talking about what what size are we talking about what is the status of this is this something that's already been scanned is this something that you know is already digitized uh it needs scanning or or documentation etc cetera, etc cetera. do we have anything else to sort of say about it like in terms of description um do we have any remarks um etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know and and then as sort of we we think about sort of as we proceed for digitization etc cetera, etc cetera, we sort of make notes on on the side so this is what we call a uh, you know a, a basic sort of inventory of of somebody's personal archive and it's it's a useful sort of first step because this is what you know because this is what allows you to undertake a complete sort of survey of the archive right um this is also a space where for instance you may decide not to scan something as you can see over here um you may decide that that certain things you know you may decide not to scan and this is an important part of of constructing archives personal archives or otherwise is decisions made in not wanting to scan something are as important as decisions made to scanning something right um but the one place where you will in a sense mark 
the the entirety of the archive even if you've chosen not to sort of enter those records into the archive is this this basic inventory the basic inventory is basically a complete sort of survey of of an archive right of a collection let us say right before it it becomes an archive yeah um and and why i i emphasize the 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 importance of picking things um to leave out is sort of keeping in mind the question of you know who is the imagined user of of your archive right and what is sort of the story you want to tell um of of that archive right um so this is basically um you know fundamentally sort of the first sort of um, process and the first level at which you're managing sort of um the various sort of records and the documents that are in your archive you're creating your initial sort of categories over here right um now the the next step is is what we call coming up with um sort of uh, uh, let us say collection levels or or thinking about hierarchies of of the archive right um now i'm going to draw examples from sort of the context of the work that i do at asia archive so you know but but feel free to sort of think of this in the context of the archive that you are working with okay now typically there are two ways of sort of very very at a very simple sort of basic level there are two ways of organizing sort of the material in somebody's archive one is to do it sort of chronologically so it's it's easy to do it decade wise so you say 1950s in the life of somebody what all documents have you found okay so this is your first level okay this is your second level and this is your third level right so this archive seems to have three levels right so your your top level second level and your third level right so you you basically divide sort of the the documents of somebody's life decade wise so the same sort of you know so so this person did artworks in the 1950s did artworks in the 1960s did artworks in the 70s of course as an artist so you know will keep making artworks so you see that the artworks as a as a folder is is recurring you know sort of every year right um then you have let us say photographs that are that are happening uh, that that we have photographs photographs of very particular kinds you divide them up into sub folders and and so on right so similarly you know as decades go by you know the their sort of uh, events in their life sort of vary you have records pertaining to different events in their life um so you know those will sort of reflect decade after decade so every sort of um uh sort of decade will sort of show a repetition of certain categories so art initiatives right involving the artist here i'm i'm showing you the example of the artist gulam mohammad sheik um so you know it will say that okay he participated in two sort of art initiatives and we have documents pertaining to that right um in the 1970s as well he participated in 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 some art initiatives um and let's say but in the okay let's take the example of curation right we say that in the 1960s he curated one exhibition in the 1970s he curated two um exhibitions in the 1980s again he curated two exhibitions and in the 1990s he curated um one exhibition so we have sort of the same category of curation repeating decade wise right the contents of it are of course changing depending on what documents we are able to find right so this is one way of presenting the life of of an artist right now let me show you at the folder level what this looks like so this is your decade wise this is how the archive will look like at the first level right but what can you make of this first level it it actually means very little if i go in as an end user who knows nothing about the artist i i you know this will not tell me anything right so it sort of it's worth considering whether we want to sort of approach the archive with you know sort of a, a different sort of approach that may that may help somebody who knows nothing so 1950s i open and he seems to have sort of artworks there seem to be documents of the art school there seem to be photographs so i just created these as just empty folders just to just to show you how we would sort of sort our our um, archival sort of materials right within photographs i would put photographs of the art community other fellow artists etc into this folder um of the art school into this folder of personal photographs into this folder but fundamentally the point i'm getting at is that um 
the top level over here itself gives you no information right so perhaps another way of thinking about dividing or or thinking about sort of um let us say um classifying and and categorizing you know sort of documents of a personal archive would perhaps be where the top level itself gives you a sense of the diversity of of practices that that as uh, the you know that the that the person under consideration has been dealing with that way you don't sort of waste um one of the things that people enjoy doing when they start archiving is they start going into multiple sort of subfolder levels right it is actually most unadvisable to allow people to sort of you know have to open a folder then another folder inside it and another folder inside it you know although it seems like a lot of fun it's actually rather painstaking because all it does is it delays the process of people arriving at the at the document itself right as fun as it is for us to sort of you know um create more and more subfolders create more and more categories the one thing that is important to do is to resist creating more and more levels right um so what we like to do at asia archive particularly is the top level this sort of the moment you enter somebody's collection right the top level of of sort of folders that you're seeing should be as vast as possible right that should be the the level that is as broad as long as as possible um and within that let us say you may have specific events specific sort of um types of of material and and once you enter let's say this itself you should be able to in a sense see all of the all of the material pertaining to that right so this is is something that we typically sort of follow so if we go back to the word document what you will see is that now i have arranged it on a Uh, in a case specific or a thematic sort of way is to say that uh, art initiatives involving you know gulam sheikh so many are there curation um, you know you have sort of all of these you can arrange this alphabetically these have been arranged alphabetically you can arrange it chronologically within you can do what you want with it but what it does is it prevents that repetition that you saw happening um, in the in the sort of in the chronological format right um it sort of uh, allows you to sort of um um uh, in a sense from the top level itself uh, you are able to sort of see material right you are able to sort of glean information about the about the archive itself right so this is how one would sort of um think about organizing the the collection levels or the or the hierarchies of 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 material for for the archive right um and and the other thing that that i wanted to sort of speak about was finally thinking about sort of the the metadata for for an archive now this um sheet that i'm showing you um is a sheet that has been prepared um by my colleagues at asia archive and is very specific to the metadata that we require as an organization that digitizes artist archives right so what i'm getting at is that the metadata for your own sheets should also sort of carry only those fields that are relevant for your personal archive right for us these fields also sort of reflect very much in terms of how people are able to um, view let us say information so this is for instance let us take let's say that we take a particular um document um okay uh this is say the manuscript of an essay this is your metadata right this is your data about the document right so it has details pertaining to what we require right for for our sort of archive so it has author it has publication but it also has things like access level access level is very specific to our archive right like i mean we are saying that it's important for us to tell people whether we've made this available online or whether we are not making it available online to people what is the copyright sort of um status of of this this uh, uh, document what content type is it so metadata again is very specific to what sort of collection you are building so if you start looking at how we build metadata so access level right this is exactly what we saw over here as well access level is this document going to be made available online or not right 
but who's deposited this material sometimes if it's a personal archive it's very straightforward you're just dealing with material from one individual but sometimes individuals carry materials that belong to others as well right in that case um the depositor will be the personal archive which you are digitizing but the copyright holder may be somebody else right so for example in this case i am dealing with a solo show catalog right which belongs to the artist milima sheik but was published by kemold prescott road gallery so in a sense they are the the copyright holders right then uh, you have what type of document is it and it it sort of is up to you to write what kind of details you would like to write about uh, um, you know what type of digitized materials you have you know in your personal archive but it helps like this to create a small subset of all the types of digitized material so you don't end up creating 20 types of digitized material i mean uh, 20 types of uh, documents right so you you make a, a limited sort of subset of of the kinds of material that you have and then you say okay is this a clipping is this a you know is this a monograph what exactly is it and and that is something you can sort of put then of course you have the title of of the document itself now these are your your basic necessary sort of information but then you can also sort of and and then you of course you have your um you know you have for instance if it is a publication you're dealing with like a book or something like that then you will require details of a publication etc etc right uh if it's an artwork or or something like that you require you know details about sort of what is the medium what is the uh, size what is the you know where was it created etc etc um but then you also have annotations right so you have description what what is this document about if not an individual document take a set of documents right so i've decided to collate an entire album which was about one particular sort of event into one i've decided that i won't be sitting and creating um descriptions for every single photograph but for an album itself so at the level of album what is the, what is the description that that you provide right so i say that this is a, a photo album etc etc so these sort of categories of let us say metadata creation um these will vary from sort of um archive to archive in the sense you may want to figure out for your own personal archive what are the sort of details that you require right um and you know so uh, this is of course you know what you're seeing here are for instance if if one has um you know newspaper clippings if one has a video um what are sort of the details if one has an artwork then what are the details etc cetera, etc cetera. so um if it's an unpublished textual material what are the details etc so this is a very elaborate sort of metadata um format that that you are looking at but fundamentally what what you need to decide is depending on who is going to be accessing your archive for what purpose you're putting together the archive what are some of the fields you would like to create right what are some of these these fields um you know in terms of you know fields and and depending on what kinds of materials you have what are the sort of what is your sort of inventory going to you know this this sort of catalog in a sense going to look like right um and while a lot of archives archivists use um you know um content management systems etc um it's it often helps just to start at the very basic with excel um uh, you know not even with word to be honest um the tree structure that you saw over here i find it a helpful tool to do it in this way as as somebody who goes and visits people's archives i find it useful to put things down like this uh but another way to do it is on excel like this you know this is the first level this is the second level this is the third level how would you sort of put put material together right um so i think at this point what i'm going to do um is actually to um maybe to stop um sharing at this point um and it is about um uh, 11 o'clock uh, uh ishita do you think it's okay if we go into the um um into the the breakout room um at this point yeah Yeah, yeah sure 
okay. I think you have discussed quite a few points. Um, everybody can take a break, um, get a coffee, and discuss with their peers about what they thought, what they felt. Uh, why I'm also agreeing with this is because they all have done their exercise once. Exactly. Right. Uh, exactly. And we discussed on Wednesday, Thursday. So right. they have reasons to sort of come back to you with a lot of questions or clarification. Exactly. 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 So um, one of the things that we had sort of um, I had put in the in the you know the workshop document, the overview and schedule was when you sort of form your groups and and when you're discussing, uh, it'll be nice to sort of discuss um, keeping in mind those those three. um questions of you know what are some of your key takeaways from the presentation that i gave um but also who is your sort of targeted end user of the archive and and therefore with regard to sort of how you plan to sort of um, um present your archive etc what form of circulation are you envisioning and what are some of the issues that you feel that are not addressed that you would like to discuss in the in the sort of uh, one hour uh, presentation so if you could sort of in your own groups maybe um you know sort of take a small break but also go back to your groups and discuss this over the next say 25 minutes or so um that would be great because then we can regroup at say 11:30 and we have a solid hour for for just discussion taking up all your questions etc cetera, etc cetera. um but ishita has also um i think assigned um one person to sort of um, report right um so every group also has somebody who's going to be the reporter so to to sort of take notes from the discussion but to summarize not to sort of um, i mean um um each each group will get about 5 to 7 minutes so um to to summarize and then we'll sort of have a uh, have a sort of an open um floor discussion um i hope that's okay ishita yes that sounds fair yeah we can close this session here